Hello Bug Group team. This safety training topic is going to be a little bit different. This month we're going to be talking about the essential job functions that our folks are doing day in and day out and how to perform them well, efficiently, and how to do them safely. So for the first one I have our subject matter expert here, Tan, who is going to show us how to safely and effectively clean a toilet stall. So Tan, first question for you, what do we need to get this job done? Well, first, you will need to have your safety goggles on, which I have on. You will need to have gloves, so you want to have on your all of your PPE. That's right. PPE. PPE. Good first step. All right, what's next? Next, you want to have your toilet brush, which I have here. Perfect. The second step to be your disinfectant. Okay, so can we use anything or does it have to be a disinfectant? It has to be a disinfectant um, that is in your SDS book. Okay, very good. And uh, if I'm not wrong, I think it's important. We use a couple of different types of disinfectants here, so it's really important to know which disinfectant you're using and to make sure that you know what the dwell time is. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you may not be killing things that you're supposed to be killing if you don't leave it on there long enough. Correct. Very good. All right, anything else? Next, you will need your red cloth, which we use for restrooms. A red one. Does the color matter? Yes, the color matters. Here at the Bud Group, we have five different types of cleaning cloths, and using the right ones is super important. The red cloth is for sanitary appliances like toilets, urinals, and bathroom stalls. The yellow cloth is for general cleaning like sinks, hand dryers, and countertops. The green cloth is for cleaning in food prep areas and break rooms. The blue cloth is for glass surfaces like mirrors and windows. And we also use a smooth light blue cloth for polishing. If we don't keep these cloths separate and use them correctly, we could be spreading bathroom germs all over the place. Even a surface someone could be eating on. All right, so we've got the tools we need. We know what we need to do the job. Uh, so I guess it's time to get into it. Yes. But i got to be honest, uh, now that we've actually made it to the stall, it, it really doesn't look that dirty. Are you sure we need to waste our time cleaning it? Yes. Cut the light and I will show you why. All right. As you can see, we have a lot more work to be done. Yeah, it looks like the bowl is clean, but the area around the toilet is, is still, still quite dirty. Still needs to be sanitized, yes. All right, so um, if we still need to clean it, I guess uh, the next thing is, um, why don't you show me how to do it? Walk us through it, what do we need to do? Okay, first thing you need to do is have your disinfected cleaner. Okay. Which would be your Virex. All right. In order for this to disinfect any bathroom areas, you're going to have to spray the complete toilet, urinals, handles, and everything, and you need it to be on dwell time for 10 minutes. Okay. 10 minutes. So it's got to be on there for 10 minutes in order to kill all the germs that it's supposed to kill. Yes, that's correct. All right, and I noticed when you did it, you really soaked it. So I guess it's important to make sure that that thing is visibly wet when you're spraying it down. Yes, it's correct. Because if you don't have all your services and your high contact services sanitized, it will not work and it will not disinfect the areas. So your bathroom will not be clean if you do not have the dwell time. All right, I guess let's spray down some other areas and wait on it for 10 minutes. All right, here we go. We're going to spray down your walls. You can do your toilet holders, your handles, your stalls. You can spray down your stall doors. All these areas that I'm spraying are high contact areas, meaning that everyone touches all of these areas. So right. you want to make sure you get everything in order to properly disinfect and clean your restroom. All right, let's wait. All right, so we've waited our 10 minutes. What's next? What's next is you will come over to your toilet bowl with your toilet brush, and you want to make sure you're going around in circles. You want to hit all the areas. You want to clean the toilet on the inside first. With your toilet bowl, you do not want to take your toilet bowl brush 
on the outside of your toilet because it will spread germs. So after you put your toilet bowl brush up, you will get your red cloth, and then I will wipe down all the areas from top to bottom all the way to the sides that I've sprayed down with the uh, Virex cleaner. And you get your handles around the sides, the front, and the back. Get your areas done. Wipe down all your other areas to make sure that you clean your complete toilet. All right, so you have wiped down the toilet and kind of the area around it. So is that it? Are we done? No, we're not done yet. We need to clean all the other high contact areas um, in the bathroom. We need to disinfect them as well with the Virex. All right, what are some of those? Some of the surfaces that we do want to make sure we disinfect are the toilet seat under the toilet bowl, the flush valve, the sanitary box, the stall handle, the stalls around the toilet, the faucet handle, the door handle, and any other places someone might touch after using the restroom. Well, Tan, it's clear that you're a pro, so thank you so much for taking the time to do this. You're very welcome. So, uh, Bug Group team, uh, we have a nice 10-step document that's going to show you exactly how to do everything that Tan talked about in 10 steps and make sure that you're cleaning the bathroom safely and effectively. And if you need that sheet, you should be able to get a hold of it from your managers. All right, on to the next task. Bathroom cleaning safety tips. First, make sure you have your appropriate PPE, including gloves and safety goggles. Next, gather all of your materials, including your toilet brush, a disinfectant, and the red-colored cleaning microfiber cloth. Then, spray all of the high-contact areas with the disinfectant spray. Be sure to leave a dwell time of at least 10 minutes. After the disinfectant has soaked, use the toilet brush to clean in the bowl. Make sure you don't use the brush outside of the toilet, and then use the red cloth to wipe down the rest of the high contact areas that were sprayed. If you have questions, refer to the 10-step cleaning manual that your manager has. All right, Bug Group team, I'm here with my good friend John, our subject matter expert on the next task that we're here to talk to you about today, and that is pulling trash. Pulling trash is one of the simplest things that we do, but it's also one of the things that causes the most injuries at the Bug Group. So John's gonna talk us through how to do that safe. So it looks like we got a trash can right here. So we're gonna pull it out, and uh, John, if you would walk us through, uh, what's the first thing we're gonna do when we get ready to pull some trash? Well, the first thing we do when we're pulling trash, we, we put our gloves on so we don't, so we don't uh, get anything on our hands. That's right, you never know what might end up being in there. Maybe some gum or you know, anything that may cause us to you know, hurt ourselves. That's right. We don't wanna have. Good deal. So what next? So the next thing we do and pulling trash. I take the take the trash trash can out. So let me ask you, this one doesn't look like there's too much in there, which is a good thing, but if it were piled up way high or it were up somewhere near the top, could we just use our hands and shove no, it down in we there? Don't, we don't use our hands to shove it down in there because it may be an object down in there that, that may puncture our hands. So, you know, we uh, we just take the trash. If it was full, we just take the trash and we tie the bag. We tie the bag first so we don't spill any trash out. Tie the bag. We pull safely. Very nice. With our knees, and then we turn and place the trash in the trash barrel. That's awesome. John just did um, a great job demonstrating the proper way to pull this out. A lot of times what our folks will do, especially at the end of the shift when they're getting tired, is they'll reach in, bending at their hips, 
and yank it out. And as you all know, sometimes that bag can get stuck in there and we start pulling with our lower back. It can cause us to pull out our low, lower back. And then the next thing that you notice he did is once he picked it up using his legs, instead of twisting and dropping it somewhere, he spun his body to face a trash can and dropped it in. This is extremely important when we're talking about being around a dumpster. So a lot of times we'll lift that up out of the barrel and we got the dumpster behind us and we'll do a twisting motion to throw it or get rid of it. And that twisting motion puts a lot of strain on our lower back. So we want to lift with our legs, turn to face where we're going to get rid of it, and then drop it off. All right, so we've got the trash out. We've got it in the brute barrel. What's next? The next thing we do, we take our trash bag, tear our trash bag, We open our trash bag. Make sure it's fully open. Put our trash bag in. And what I like to do is uh, make sure it's secure on both sides. And I tie it and make sure it's tight around the rims so the trash doesn't seep out in, in the trash. That's right, keeping those edges tight is gonna keep that liquid or anything else from pulling the trash bag down into the trash can. And I like to be a little neat about it so I tuck it in. That's right, just like you would your bed at home, that's right. All right, so then we're gonna load this thing back up. Load Very back good. Up. And we would proceed to do that around the rest of the building. So what happens now if we're putting all of our tr trash can bags in here, what happens now when this thing gets kind of full? Well, when it gets kind of full, make sure you take the bag. You want to make sure you tie it. Always tie the bag because you don't want any liquids to seep out. Very good. And you take the trash barrel, take the trash barrel to the, to the trash. Yeah, so you got tilt cart there and we're tilt gonna cart. offload it in a tilt cart. Very good. So if you'll notice, one of the things that John said was when it gets kind of full. So this is really important. Again, when we get working too fast, too hard, sometimes uh, we let that thing get too full and get too heavy. So it's important that when this brute barrel gets about two-thirds of the way full, we want to make sure we go ahead and tie that off and get it moved into the trash can. In some of our accounts, we have tilt carts to put it in, and in other accounts, we're going to be rolling the brute can straight to the dumpster. All right, well, John, I appreciate all those tips and tricks, and uh, hopefully right. we'll see you again soon. Yes, you will. Thank you. Trash removal safety tips. Always wear gloves when you're pulling trash. If the trash can is full, don't push down on it. This way we avoid touching anything dangerous. Then tie the bag before you remove it from the container. Lift the bag using your legs and your arms. This way we avoid straining your back. When you're placing the bag into a larger trash can, turn your body with the trash so you are facing the new container before you drop it. Do not twist your back. Then repeat these steps with the body positions when you're moving the trash to any larger containers. Place a new trash bag in the empty containers and tie the loose ends so that the bag is tight to the rim of the container. All right, Bug Group team, we are here in this J closet to talk about something that our folks have to do every day, and that's mixing chemicals. So we're here with our account supervisor, Cassandra, to talk about how we can do this safely. Uh, make sure that when we mix the chemicals, we are doing it efficiently, effectively, and safely so that when we take that chemical out, we can get the job done the way that we need to. So uh, what are the first thing we need to know before we get mixing any chemicals? You always have your PPE on, your protective equipment, your goggles, your gloves, so no spillage on your hands or in your eyes. That's right. Definitely want to keep it out of our eyes. That's super, super important. So I'm glad you mentioned that. And you just never know. Sometimes it can splash back up or we may spill it. So that's very good. Okay. So um, I noticed this bottle has a label on it. So what do we need to know about bottles and labels? We need to always make sure that your labels match. Um, the K 
chemicals that you're putting into your into your bottles. Very good. Okay, so anytime we're pouring a chemical out of something and into something else, we want to make sure that the bottle that we're pouring out of it has a label and that that label matches the bottle that we're pouring it into. Yes. Okay, so um, this method that we have here is what we have at some of our accounts and it is called the RTD method or ready to dispense. And if you'll notice, this is actually a different type of label than is on this bottle because this is not what Cassandra typically uses yes. at this account, it's just for demonstration purposes. So she's just going to walk us through how you would do this without actually dispensing the chemical. Okay, so you would always make sure that your water was turned on. Okay. And open up your bottle away from your face. Always thinking about the safety. Place it in, and then you would just dispense. Just, just like that. Very good. As simple as that. Um, and then, so once you've dispensed it, uh, what do we need to do? Okay, once you, you turn your water off to make sure that you're disconnecting it. Just like that. Yes. Very good. So this is really important, Bug Group Team. Um, if we leave that water on, it's going to allow that water to build up right here at the bottle and, um, and, and could cause uh, could cause it, the gasket or something to break and the next thing you know we have water all over this. So super important to turn the water off and disconnect that RTD dispenser. Okay, very good. So at this account we actually use the J-Fill. So Cassandra, how would you uh, use this chemical mixing method? Okay, and I would turn it on first to make sure everything's on. Take the top off the bottle. Make sure that I select the proper selection which is crew for the chemical that we're about to dispense. Clear the line. Once it's clear, place the bottle under the nozzle. Push and fill. Very good. Man, what a cool piece of equipment. Yes. It sure does make it easy. And then I always recommend go ahead and clear in the line when you're done as well, just in case somebody gets in here and, and um, forgets to clear it before they use it. All you're doing when you're clearing it out is making sure that if you're swapping from one chemical to another that you're not mixing them in the container that you're using. Yes. Very good. Um, and then we should turn the water off. Always turn the water off. That's right. So the last method, um, which we use a lot when we're working with floor and floor care, is having to just mix the chemicals by hand. So if we were mixing the chemicals by hand, say in a mop bucket, yes. um, what were some of the things we'd need to know about that? I always put the water in first and make sure that you have the proper ratio for the water to the chemical. Okay, very good. So always important to get that water in there first. That's going to keep the chemical from hitting that hard plastic and splashing back up into our eyes. Again, very important to make sure we have the right PPE on. And like Cassandra said, we want to make sure that we know the ratio before we start pulling, pouring that in there to make sure we're mixing uh, and diluting that chemical at the right rate. Very good. These are all great things to know. And the last thing I would say is well, anytime we're mixing chemicals, we need to be sure uh, that we know where our SDS or our safety data sheets are located for the account. And the reason this is important is Sometimes accidents happen, and if you were to get a chemical in your eye or somewhere where it was starting to cause imitation, irritation, we'd want to make sure we can go to that SDS sheet uh, and see um, all the chemical properties that we needed and, and go ahead and report that uh, in the proper ways. So, thanks for having me, and I look forward to seeing you soon. And thank you. Absolutely. All right. Safety tips for mixing chemicals. First, always wear the appropriate PPE, including gloves and safety goggles. Before you fill up an empty chemical bottle, read the label. The dispensing container should have the matching label of the bottle. If you're using an RTD or ready to dispense, first connect the tubing and then turn on the water. Fill the bottle as needed and then turn the water off and disconnect the RTD. If you're using a J-fill, first select your chemical and then clear the line before and after you fill the bottle. If you're filling by hand, first put your water in for a proper ratio of chemical to water. Refer to the SDS if you have any questions or spills or accidents. All right, Bug Group team, we're here to check in on our next task that you guys are doing on a daily basis, which is vacuuming, specifically vacuuming with a backpack vacuum. So. We are here with our subject matter expert, Alex, who's going to 
help us talk through how to make sure we're doing it safely when we're using the backpack vacuum. So Alex, before we're going to get going with the vacuum, what do we need to do before we get started? Well, first we have to check the frame. Okay, so we're checking the cord to make sure there's no frays all the way through it. Good. What else do we need to check? And we see how the plug. Okay. Yes, so we have to make sure it has all three prongs, the ground prong, which often gets broken off. Now, bug group team, if you find one that has a broken ground prong, don't use it. Contact your manager uh, and let them know that it's been broken and we can either get it fixed or get that cord replaced. All right, so we've checked the cord. Um, what do we need to check on the vacuum before we get going? Checking to clean the vacuum. Okay, so we're checking to make sure the bag is clean. Very good. And a good rule of thumb is, if that thing is more than two thirds of the way full, we need to go ahead and empty it out before we get using it because the more weight that builds up there, uh, the harder it is to carry and the less suction that you're getting. And we also need to check the filter. All right, so we've checked the cord and we've checked the vacuum. So I think we're ready to get into it. Uh, so this is maybe the most important piece. Alex is gonna show us how to put the vacuum on and wear it correctly. Okay. So you'll notice as he's putting it on, he's already got these straps adjusted for his use and it's got the vacuum up nice and high on his back. We want to avoid these straps getting saggy and getting low on your back because it's going to put stress on your lower back. So keeping it up high allows you to keep good posture. And the next important thing is to make sure we use both of the straps that are on the vacuum. The one that goes around the waist and then the one that goes up around the chest. And these are so important because they evenly distribute the weight of the backpack. So oftentimes as I'm traveling around, I'll see people who have the backpack and it's sagging down on their lower back and they don't have either one of these straps. And what's happening is, is it's pulling your body in the wrong direction and putting a lot of stress on our lower back that we don't need. And it really makes the backpack feel a lot heavier than it truly is. So really important, keep it up high, keep these straps nice and tight, and then make sure we strap it in both places. And then the last thing we want to talk about is if you'll notice, this cord is extremely long that we are using. And that's because you have a lot of ground to cover. So with that in mind, make sure, and I'm sure Alex would affirm this, that we get that, once we get that thing plugged in, we're conscious of where we're cleaning. We don't want to be plugged in in this room, this office, for instance, and then walk across the hall and clean the next office. We want to make sure we move the plug to the next office just in case any of our other teammates or someone else in this building would happen to walk by. We wouldn't want them to trip over that cord or we wouldn't want ourselves to trip over it. So Alex, thanks for your help. We appreciate it and we'll uh, let you get back to work. Thank you. Vacuum safety tips. First, check the cord to make sure there are no frays and that the ground prongs are intact. Then check your vacuum filter. If the bag is at least two thirds full, you should change it before you start vacuuming. If you're using a backpack vacuum, make sure you, you wear it high on your back. Attach both the waist and the chest straps and make sure they're tight. Then observe the length of the cord. Replug when necessary to avoid tripping. All right, bug group team, on to the next floor care task that we are doing on a daily basis, and that's mopping. So we are here with our subject matter expert, Aunt Angelica, and she is gonna show us uh, how to mop safely. So if we are mopping, we're gonna mop this area, what's the first thing we wanna do, make sure we have the equipment we wanna have before we get going? Well, you always wanna make sure that you have your slip resistant shoes on and... That's right, and if you don't have some, luckily she has some of her own and those are great. Those have been approved by her supervisor. If you don't have those, you can use the one that the bug group offers, which are covers that can go over your normal shoes and your manager should make sure that these are in uh, your J closets for you. What else would we need? We need our wet floor signs. That's right. We got to have a wet floor sign, maybe more than one, depending on the area we're doing. We got to make sure we keep our customers aware that we have a wet floor as well as our other teammates to make sure nobody's slipping and falling. So we've got the equipment. Um, what next? If we were going to mop this room, what would be important for us to know? Well, we would start from the back of the room and mop our way out of the room. Okay, so starting in the back, yeah. and you can go ahead and start for us and show us, and that would be great. So notice she's going to wring the mop out really well, and then start in that back left corner and work her way out of the room.
Very good. And in doing this, this keeps her from ever having to walk back over the wet surface. And one other thing that you'll notice that she's doing really well is instead of using a twisting mo motion, you can see that she's using a rocking motion to pull the mop back and forth. Just like when we're lifting boxes or pulling trash, we want to avoid twisting when we can because that's an easy way to pull out our back. We want to make sure we're using our legs instead of our back. All right, very good. So we've got this thing mopped up. So my next question for you is, when we finish this room and we're all done, what are we going to do with this, this dirty mop and this bucket? We're going to pour the content out and we're going to wring our mop out and then we're going to uh, rinse the mop out and rinse the container out. Okay, so mm -hmm. make sure we rinse them out. A lot of times when I go into some of our J closets, um, somebody hasn't rinsed out the mop and it's just kind of just sitting there in the mop bucket and that's what sometimes makes our closets have not such a great smell. So I'm glad you said that. Mm -hmm. Very important to rinse out the bucket and rinse out the mop thoroughly and then we can hang it up um, so that it can dry out, air out, and we can turn the mop upside, the mop bucket upside down to rinse out and dry out really well as well. Well, thank you so much for showing us how to do it safely and I hope okay. to see you again soon. Okay, all right, thank you. Mopping safety tips. First, wear slip resistant shoes. If you don't have any, make sure you use a shoe cover. Ask your manager where these are if you can't find them. Then place wet floor signs around the area. Place your mop in the bucket with the appropriate chemical. Wring it out and then start mopping at the back of the room. This way you avoid walking in the wet areas. While mopping, use a rocking motion instead of a twisting motion. This will help your back. When you're finished, wring out the mop, empty the bucket, and then rinse the bucket with water. Hey, Austin, how are you? I am doing so well, and I'm so glad I caught you right in the middle of doing what we want to talk to our bug group teammates about. So bug group team, uh, we have dropped in on Stephanie here, our subject matter expert, to tell you a little bit about high dusting, which is something you guys are doing every single day. So we want to talk with Stephanie about how to make sure we're doing it safely. So Stephanie, before you get set up and you get going high dusting, what are some of the things that you need to make sure you're wearing, the PPE that you need to be have on? I need to make sure I'm wearing my gloves and uh, my goggles. That's exactly right. The goggles are extremely important. Uh, we see this a lot at the bug group. Sometimes people forget to wear their goggles and they get the high dust in and they knock something off that ends up getting in their eyes. And uh, that's not something that we want. So goggles are super important. Glad to see that you have those on. Thank you. I also see that you've got some fancy equipment here. Uh, so this is another really important piece for us to have when we're doing this type of work. Uh, we have different variations of this, but basically we want to have some type of duster that we can put on the end of an extension wand. And the reason is, this allows Stephanie to reach up high so that she doesn't have to climb up on a ladder and that is so important. We don't want to use a ladder if we don't have to. So we've got our PPE, we've got our equipment. Uh, what are some of the places that we might be going to do this type of dusting? Some of the places that we need to dust regularly are ceiling vents, ceiling corners, door trim and molding, the top of bathroom stalls and rails, and any other high places that might collect dust. Well, Stephanie, thank you for taking the time to do this. We really appreciate it, and you taking the time to show our folks how to make sure we're high dusting safely, talking about some of the places we should be doing it and how to do it safely. Uh, the last thing we want to make sure we mention is if you need to dust somewhere that you cannot reach with an extension pole and need to use a ladder, please make sure you let your manager know and that you have been approved to use that ladder in that situation. Uh, we don't want to be using ladders uh, if we don't have to. So thanks for your help and uh, I hope to see you soon. Thank you. High dusting safety tips. First, make sure you're wearing your appropriate PPE, gloves and safety goggles. When high dusting, use an extension pole. This way we can avoid using ladders. Remember to clean high places that commonly collect dust, like ceiling vents, corners, door trims, bathroom stalls, and railings. If you absolutely must use a ladder, 
talk to your manager first and get approval. 